Well, hello, and welcome to our March 5th, 2019 Anatomy 120 Zoom session. What today, the purpose of what we, what we will do, be doing today is reviewing. Reviewing all of what we've covered so far. Your midterm, I understand, is mostly on the outer and the middle ears and does not really include the inner ear. But with that, no matter, we'll just start with the outer ear and make sure we cover the salient points, the things we need to know. And uh, so, purpose of today's Zoom session, review. So, without any further ado, let's do the review. So, here we go, share screen. And let's see what kind of notes we've got here for unit number two. It's unit two, because unit one was the, the whole ear, overview of the whole ear. Well, we don't really need to go there. Let's look at unit two, outer ear anatomy and physiology. If you haven't got your notes in front of you, now might be a good time to pause the Zoom session, get them, and then come back, okay? Anyway, looking here, the oracle or pinna, the five pieces or parts you need to know, Actually, four. Helix, antihelix, tragus, and concha. Meatus, the Latin word for opening. You should always have, have in mind that the outer ear canal is about an inch long, two and a half centimeters, and it has a bend in it. Actually, it has two bends in it. It's a dog leg. Okay, if I were to draw the outer ear for you, the canal, it would be shaped much like and stop sharing for a second. The outer ear canal has a dog leg to it. Okay, has two bends, one here and one here. Very important, that's why you're pulling the outer ear up and back when you're looking in with an otoscope. Very important to remember that. Share screen. And let's look at our good old uh, PowerPoint here. There's your, this is a, 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 a typical picture of an outer ear canal, but in all actuality, please remember it is bent, has two bends. Also take note that you have the member, I mean a, a, a cartilaginous portion and a bony portion. Just like your nose, when you have your, your fingers on the bridge of your nose, the top of your nose, the skin covers bone. The bottom of your nose, you can wiggle. Okay, follow your nose, it always knows. So the skin on the inner half of your canal covers bone. The skin on the outer half of the canal covers cartilage. You can wiggle and move the whole ear cartilage, but of course you can't move the bone. That's why you have to be very careful when you're looking in with an otoscope that you don't pinch the skin. See, this is called the speculum or the specula. You don't want this here to pinch the skin right at, these, at this junction here or here. You have to be very careful when you're looking in an ear canal. Pull the ear up and back and carefully always brace. You'll be shown that in your labs. Never just look in with an otoscope looking straight in like bull. Can't do that, okay? Always be bracing with the finger against the cheek while you're looking in, but you will learn that more in labs. So, all right. Again, the way too many words on here. Helix, anti-helix, so follow my cursor, the outermost helix, then you're going in, anti-helix, concha bowl, and tragus. Don't worry about any of the other ones. The skin underneath the cartilaginous portion of your canal, so the skin underneath here, this, and this, okay? Not here and not over the bone. The skin covering the cartilage has lots of glands in it, and that's what produces cerumen, earwax. Wax formation in the ear occurs due to excessive act activity of these glands. Cerumen waterproofs the skin and protects the external ear canal from agents such as insects. Insects don't like cerumen. All right. When you are looking in an ear canal and you're looking at an eardrum, 
You will see various things. When you're looking at an eardrum, make sure you have the following landmarks memorized. And, the, and, and various, here, look, the outer rim is the annulus, A-N-N-U-L-U-S, annulus. The large part here is the pars tensa. The small part here is the pars flacida. And this Y-shaped business here is called the nodes of Ranvier, R-A-N-V-E-R, V-E-I-R, or V-I-E-R, R-A-N-V-I-E-R, nodes of Ranvier, all right? So that's what separates the pars tensa from the pars flacida. What are these pars flacida and tensa for? Well, the pars tensa is the main part of your eardrum. That's what's vibrating with sound. Then the pars flacida is very thin skin. It only has two layers of skin. It doesn't have the thin, the thick membranous fibrous middle layer. Okay, it just has the, and it is very, and it accommodates tiny air pressure changes such as going up a couple flights of stairs. The tiny air pressure changes that occur due to going up a, a small hill or are accommodated by the pars flacida being able to move in or out. Remember, the air pressure on either side of the drum should be really fairly equal, okay? But the pars flacida accommodates tiny changes in air pressure without you needing to swallow or blow your nose or chew gum or whatever to open up your eustachian tubes to let new air into your middle ear space, okay? The pars flacida accommodates tiny changes in air pressure without you needing to do that. If the pressure, if you're going up a real steep, like a lot of a mountain or a very tall building in an elevator, your pars placida can no longer accommodate the larger changes in air pressure. And so then you have to swallow or yawn or something to pop your ears so that you can allow the air pressure around you to equalize with the air pressure behind your eardrums. The only way you can open up the, the, uh, the air pressure or the air space behind your eardrums, what's, your, what's behind your eardrum? Your middle ear space. And your middle ear space only communicates with the outside with, through the eustachian tubes. And so you, that's why you've got to swallow or whatever to allow new air to get in there so that you can equalize the air pressure on both sides of the drum. The pars flacida just accommodates tiny changes in air pressure without you needing to do that. Okay. So, no, looking at the landmarks of the outer, the ear, the uh, eardrum. Another landmark is this big teardrop shape thing coming down here. This is the manubrium of the malleus, the handle of the malleus bone, ending at the umbo, U M B O, the umbo. So, and the last thing, or here you can even see the long process of the incus. The long process of the incus ending at the top of the stapes. And the stapes you can't see, but the long process of the incus. And the last landmark you need to know is the cone of light. The cone of light. And the cone of light isn't really anything, but it's just a reflection of light off of your otoscope. And in a healthy eardrum, the cone of light is at five o'clock in the right ear and seven o'clock in the left ear. Here is a, a schematic showing you the three layers of tissue of the, uh, of the eardrum itself. This would be your outer ear canal. There's your annulus. Here's your umbo, number four, or the manubrium of your malleus ending at the umbo. But there's the tough middle layer of skin. So you have one layer of skin in yellow here. The middle layer is the tough fibrous layer of skin. And then this red here is just a schematic of your middle ear space. So you have an inner layer of tissue as well. The eardrum is the only part of the body that retains all three original embryonic layers of tissue. Ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Just FYI. 
the outer ear canal resonance and speech. The outer ear canal has that resonance as a quarter wave resonator that we covered in 110 acoustics a little more than an hour ago. Okay, and we said that the ear canal as a quarter wave resonator is going to resonate with sound waves four times its length. So it's going to resonate with sound waves four inches long because the ear canal is one inch long and the speed of sound is 1130 feet per second. And what's four inches? It's a third of a foot. And remember, you can't divide feet by inches. You can't apples and oranges. You've got to divide apples by apples and oranges by oranges. So you have to convert the, the, the four inches into feet. And what's four inches? It's a third of a foot. 0.3333 of a foot, right? A half is 0.5. A third is 0.33. Well, do the math now. Get out your calculator. Do 1130 feet per second. 1130 feet per second divided by 0.33 feet equals 3,424 hertz. So that's going to be the resonant frequency of your ear canal. But your ear canal is not made out of glass or steel, okay? It's made out of flesh and bone. And so that resonance gets spread. And there it is. Between 1,500 and 4,000 hertz with a peak resonance of 2,700 hertz. And what's the value of that resonance? About 20. I guess the way to look at it is this. Let's say you had a speaker here and you were putting out 50 dB of sound, 50 dB SPL, okay? And you put out 50 dB at 250 hertz. And let's say you had a tube in your ear canal and it was sitting right against the drum, right near to the drum, and it had a microphone. So you have a speaker here emitting a tone of 250 hertz at 50 dB SPL. What are you going to pick up here? 250 hertz at 50 dB SPL. 500 hertz out of the speaker at 50 dB SPL. What are you going to measure here? 500 hertz at 50 dB SPL. 1,000 hertz out of the speaker at 50 dB SPL. What are you going to measure at your end of your ear, inside your ear canal? 1,000 hertz at 50. 2,000 hertz at 50 dB SPL coming from a speaker. What are you going to measure here? Probably closer to something like 70. There's that resonance happening. 3,000 hertz at 50 dB SPL out of a speaker. What are you going to measure inside your ear? About 3,000 hertz at about 70 again. See, you're getting that resonance. That's what I mean. And the same thing would happen at 4,000 hertz. And then when you get above 4,000 hertz coming out of a speaker at 50 dB SPL, once again, you're going to measure 8,000 hertz at 50. You will have no added resonance. Okay? Outer ear canal resonance is very important as a natural amplifier for soft high frequency consonants of speech. If you measured the ear, the concha bowl resonance, it's around five to six thousand hertz. The concha bowl. Okay, this little guy right here, the concha bowl. The resonance of that is around five to 6,000 hertz. The resonance of the ear canal that we just talked about is around 2,700 hertz. See that? And when you add all this together, you get T for total. And there you go. Follow this line here. It's a lot like what I drew here. This would be that T for total. It includes the resonance of your ear canal as well as the added resonance of your concha bowl. So the shape of your outer ear. The whole thing is very important in a, as a natural amplifier for the high frequency soft consonants of speech. The outer ear as a quarter wave resonator and together with the resonance of the concha bowl of the ear. So when you're looking at this photograph and you're talking about ear canal resonance, concha bowl resonance, adding all these things together, you get the T for total. And once again, see how it's about 20? And it starts at about 1,500 hertz and ends at or past 4,000 hertz with a peak at around 2,700 hertz. Don't worry about that slide. So 
on an audiogram upon which you test speech or a hearing, here's the letters of speech. There they are. Z, v, j, m, d, b, and all your vowels louder and lower. And when you start getting to k, f, s, f, softer and higher, that's why you have the outer ear canal resonance, because they are softer and they cannot be heard as, res as readily. So the ear canal resonance acts like a natural lift for these soft, high-frequency consonants. Something else is weird about the outer ear, okay? When you plug the outer ear, your voice gets louder. And that's called the occlusion effect. Hum with me and plug your ear. So if you're talking, your voice is louder when your ear is plugged. That's called the occlusion effect. You can also do that kind of a thing with what, they, what doctors use in a tuning fork test. And the tuning fork test that's based on the occlusion effect is called the Bing tuning fork test. And they put the stem of the fork on the mastoid. Do you hear that? Yep, now plug the ear. Did it get louder? Yep. When you unplug it, did it get softer? Yep. Louder, unplugged. Plug, louder. You can do the Bing test without a tuning fork. Hum and plug your ear. Mm, louder, mm, softer, mm, louder. If you don't get the occlusion effect, you've got a problem with the middle ear. Okay, so doctors use tuning fork tests to assess the integrity of your middle ears. And one of the tests is the Bing, B-I-N-G, tuning fork test, and it's based on the occlusion effect. So let's call the occlusion effect for what it is. Let's, let's make sure we understand what it is. The occlusion effect. Here's bone conduction oscillator used in testing hearing, and you'll learn more about this next semester, but it's sending sound through the bone straight to the cochlea. It's bypassing the outer ear, and it's bypassing the middle ear. But notice what happens is when you plug the ear canal, the, the occlusion effect sound that would come out is blocked. It can't. So it's forced back into the middle ear. And that's why your voice gets louder when you plug your ears. Let me say the lay definition first. The occlusion effect, your voice gets louder when your ear is plugged. Done. Now the professional one. And write down on your papers, number one, low frequency. Has to be low frequency. Number two, bone conducted sound, sound transmitting through the bone, resonates the mat. Number three, resonates the mass of your skull because lows resonate mass, right? You learn that in acoustics. Number four, that, in turn, makes the cartilaginous portion of your ear canal vibrate. Plugging your ear prevents that added resonance from escaping. Number five. Number five. Plugging your ear prevents that from escaping. So here we go again. Number one, low frequency. Number two, bone conducted sound. Number three, resonates the mass of your skull. Number four, which in turn resonates the cartilaginous portion of your ear canal. Number five, plugging your ear prevents that from escaping. Occlusion effect. It's why hearing aids have holes in them called vents so that they don't plug up your ears. Otherwise, hearing aids are going to make the listener's own voice sound too loud. And why would I have that when I'm talking? I mean, I can see why that would take place with a tuning fork or something, but why when I'm talking? Because when I'm talking, I'm hearing myself through air, sound, but I'm also hearing myself through the bone. 
I'm hearing myself through air con conduction of sound, sound waves traveling from my mouth to my ears, but also I'm hearing my own voice through the ra rattling of my own skull. Low frequency bone conducted sounds resonate the mass of your skull, which in turn gets the cartilaginous portion moving. Plugging your ear prevents that added resonance from escaping. Occlusion effect. Have that down. It's very important because occlusion effect is a, plays a big part in why people don't like hearing aids. And you have to fix that problem. As a hearing instrument specialist, you have to know what to do. We're not teaching that in anatomy, but we're teaching you why the occlusion effect occurs in the first place. There you go. Occlusion effect. Oh, there's a plug. Here's a plug ear. What would you call that pathology? Atresia. Atresia. And it's commonly found with a with a, um, with a, a disorder or a, a syndrome called Treacher Collins. T R E A C H E R, Treacher, and then a separate word, Collins. C O L L I N S, Collins. Treacher Collins syndrome. So basically, sound waves caught by the pinna or the outer ear, external auditory meatus, wobbling the tympanic membrane, moving the middle ear ossicles, vibrating the foot plate of the stapes in and out of the oval window, moving fluid waves in the membranous labyrinth, vibration of your basilar membrane where your hair cells are, and the bending of the hair cells of the organ of cordy by the tectorial membrane. Tells your brain you're hearing sound. Not bad. Okay, so here's a pair of real hairy ears, but let's, before we go there, let's make sure we follow closely in our notes. Where are we in our notes? So, you've all covered then that the inner half of the ear canal has no glands or hair. Cerumen, you know what it is. Don't worry about sebaceous and apocrine glands. I couldn't care less. Otoscopic exam, pull ear up and back. Temporal mandibular joint syndrome, moving the jaw, where it articulates with the skull, TMJ. The jaw, where, see that movement up here? That's really close to my outer ear canal. Arthritis of your jaw joint can often cause pain in the outer ear canal. TMJ, temporal mandibular joint syndrome. Okay, just so you know what it is, back to the notes. Eardrum or tympanic membrane, it has three layers. Following closely here, umbo, manubrium, annulus, nodes of Ranvier, pars tensa, sometimes called shrapnel's membrane, pars flaccida, cone of light, Five o'clock in the right ear, left ear, seven o'clock. A bit of outer ear embryology, knowing ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. The eardrum is the one area of the body that contains or retains all three layers of that. And now the physiology of the outer ear. The resonance of the concha. The ear canal is a quarter wave resonator. Okay, why, why and what's the benefit here? We've covered that verbally in our PowerPoint, but here it is in writing. And there's that occlusion effect. There it is. The Bing tuning fork test, based on the occlusion effect. Loudness of bone conducted sound increases when the ear is plugged. And I say low frequency especially, because if you do this with the letter S, and now plug your ear, You don't hear much difference, but mm, the occlusion effect is a low frequency phenomenon. That's what I mean. You know what I mean? All right. Okay. Here we go. Disorders of the ear, stenosis, atresia, osteoma. And then we had pictures to show you. Here's just a guy with a very hairy ear. Here's 
atre there's a complete atresia. Normal eardrum, cone of light. You know it's got to be the right ear because the cone of light is at five o'clock. Manubrium of the malleus, umbo, annulus, long process of the incus, pars tensa, pars flacida. Another eardrum. Can't really see the separation of pars tensa from pars flacida very well on here. Outer half of the ear canal where cerumen grows, where hair grows, inner half of the ear canal. You can see the eardrum at the end. No hair there, no wax. So wax and hair, that stuff occurs in the cartilaginous, the outermost half of the ear canal. Earwax, yellow earwax, old earwax and black. Remember we were seeing these slides a few weeks ago? Stenosis is caused by a partial blocking of the ear canal. Stenosis, a partial blocking. It can be due to earwax. It can be due to a bead stuck in the ear. It could be due to a bug stuck in the ear. Stenosis means a partial closing of the outer ear canal. Remember, if you've got a situation like this, you have really no hearing loss. As long as sound can get past the wax, you'll have essentially no hearing loss due to wax. Wax does, even if it's blocked, wax doesn't create that much hearing loss. Maybe 20, 20 dB of hearing loss at the most. Here's injury to the ear canal because the ear canal skin is very thin, easy to get damaged. A blood blister forming in the ear canal. Someone was too aggressive in the use of cotton tipped, what do you call it, uh, Q-tips. External otitis, external ear canal, oto, ear, itis, inflammation, inflammation of the outer ear canal. Bony exotoses, these are tumors growing under the skin, often as a result of frequent exposure to the cold, usually by swimming, swimmer's ear. Osteoma, in contrast to exotoses, which are common, osteomas are rare benign tumors of the temporal bone, usually lying in the external ear canal. If they occur, they are more likely to warrant surgical removal as they more frequently compromise the canal. So that's causing a stenosis, a partial blocking. Here's a hole in the eardrum. It can heal by itself, but it might not. And look at this kind of leads to unit uh, three in the middle ear, which we'll look at next. This is an incision in the eardrum or myringotomy. In persistent cases of a, of a hole in the eardrum, it won't really heal. But uh, although given enough time, oh yeah, I see. In given enough time, otitis media, oto ear, itis inflammation, middle ear, they can resolve on its own, but sometimes they, it requires puncturing the eardrum. So the first step in this process was a myringotomy. And then they suction the infection out. And then they might put a tube in that ear. Traumatic perforation of the eardrum. Yikes. Otitis media, a bulging of the eardrum. This would be what stage of otitis media? Serous otitis media or suppurative or purulent otitis media? The answer would be suppurative or purulent. The infection, the fluid has turned infectious and now has, filled to, has turned to pus. The first changes are usually redness in the drum and slight swelling, particularly of the upper portion, the pars flacida. Look at that. Really bulging. Here would be the umbo. As the condition progresses, the middle ear fills with pus. Otitis media with effusion, glue ear, chronic condition results from prolonged otitis media problems, prolonged eustachian tube dysfunction, 
leading to a mucoid effusion or you know, filling up of the middle ear. The most common cause of mild to moderate hearing loss in children. Classical appearances with a dull appearances to the to the tympanic membrane. Loss of of of, of a lots of the uh, cone of light, indicating fluid in the middle ear. There's a foreshortening of the malleus handle, including retraction. Well, it's kind of all a bit medical words, but at any rate, the eardrum is the person's had long standing chronic otitis media as opposed to acute or sudden, severe. Looking at various fluids, this is infectious fluid, this is clear serous fluid, serous otitis media, early otitis media. Serous otitis media, looking like uh, bubbles are in the ear. Look at this. Maybe this is achieved by performing a forced expiration with the mouth and nose closed and literally making one's ears pop. The air in the middle ear can be seen here in the form of bubbles. <laughs> a tube in the eardrum to bypass the dysfunctional eustachian tube. Your station tube isn't opening very well because the, the tonsils are swollen shut. And so what you need to do is to pr provide a new entry for air to get in. And the tubes eventually grow out. This is a tube that's finally growing out. Looks like a, a, a grub growing on the guy's ear. It's just tympanosclerosis. A scarred eardrum. Doesn't mean the person's not a nice person, but basically classic horseshoe shaped of tympanosclerosis. Commonly associated with insertion of ventilation tubes. Thought to be a combination of bleeding within the layers of the eardrum at the time of tube insertion and subsequent shear stresses with the tube in place. Who knows? Really retracted eardrum. Here's the foot, the neck of the stapes, or the long process of the incus, the neck of the stapes. This would be the promontory between the oval window here and the round window down here. Wow. Cholesteatoma. Classic white cheesy appearance of a cholesteatoma. So let's now move to the middle ear and look at that. Cholesteatoma, here's a perforated eardrum. Whoa, perforated, a pinhole as opposed to a big one. This will likely require surgery of a skin graft over top of the drum. Sometimes they put cigarette paper right over top here to act as a scrim for new skin to grow across. If it's a small hole, it can often heal by itself. But cholesteatoma, let's look at that for a second. That's when the eardrum has ruptured and the skin is trying to heal itself. And parts of the healing of the skin, they don't stay on the outside of the drum. Now the ear, now parts of the outer ear are entering into the middle ear space. And some of that skin is, is now in the middle ear space. And it rapidly grows into a benign tumor. And that's got to be taken out because the middle ear space is only an eighth of an inch from the brain. So weird stuff. Perforate, whoa. Subtotal for obvious reasons. Yikes. <laughs> middle ear cholesteatoma on rare occasions squamous and just call it skin may become trapped in the middle ear during early development hmm. and it can also happen with a perforated eardrum and the perforations trying to heal and that scar tissue now is now stuck, trapped in the middle ear space. And when that happens, the outer ear tissue is where it shouldn't be. It's in the middle ear space now. And that's what turns into a cholesteatoma. The result is a slowly growing cyst. The only indication which may seem be seen here, a white tumor seen behind here. Advanced middle ear cholesteatoma, if left untreated, will, glow, will grow, eroding the ossicles and filling the middle ear cavity. Wow. Okay, so enough on that. Let's look at some middle ear notes here and make sure we've got covered what we need to regarding the middle ear for your midterm.
So let's go. And again, just like we did in acoustics, we're spending more time on the earlier stuff because it was further away. And the, you know, when, you, when we're at the, at the inner ear, well, that's not even on your midterm, but also it's really recent. So let's spend the rest of our time here on the middle ear. So know what it consists of. The inner ear skin of the tympanic membrane, the closed middle ear space lined with mucous layer of skin surrounded by porous mastoid bone, eustachian tube, which is closed unless otherwise forced open. That's why the middle ear space is a closed space. Okay, the middle ear ossicles and their ligaments that hold the ossicular chain in place. Think of the three ossicles as one unit, the ossicular chain. And then you have the two muscles, the stapedius muscle and the tensor tympani muscle. The stapedius muscle attached to the neck of the stapes, the tensor tympani muscle attached to the manubrium of the malleus. And the, tense, the stapedius muscle is smaller, but it's stronger. And it's innervated by the seventh facial nerve. It's one of the cranial nerves. It's the seventh pair of cranial nerves. And the tensor tympani muscle is innervated by the fifth cranial nerve called the trigeminal nerve. Why trigeminal? Because it, it breaks off into three portions. So the parts of the middle ear, recall the temporal bone has two parts, a soft mastoid portion that houses the outer ear canal, mastoid bone, the hard petrous portion that surrounds most of the middle ear space and the cochlea. So the middle ear space is surrounded partly by soft porous mastoid bone and partly by more, by, um, uh, more harder petrous portion of the temporal bone. It's about the size of a sugar cube, the middle ear space. The mucous membrane lines the entire middle ear space, including the inside of the tympanic membrane and the eustachian tube. Don't worry so much about the juggler vein and all that stuff. The epitympanic recess, the middle ear space just above the eardrum and the malleus. The adatus ad antrum, the, air, the space above the incus and the stapes. So let's look at that in a picture. Here we are. Okay. Adatus ad antrum, epitympanic recess. All right. Bring it closer. So look at the ossicular chain. Notice that there's a fulcrum here, or that there's a, this, these turn together. When this is pushed in, it makes this whole thing move, much like this. Think of one arm here as the malleus, the other arm here as the incus, and this is the fulcrum, the, the, the thing upon the axis upon which things move. Okay? So it's not just that this hits this, which moves that. Uh uh. Your, the eardrum would be on this side. So when sound is pushing on the manubrium of the malleus, the incus is moved. So when sound is pushed here, this is going to be pushing in, which will bend that. And then you've got the smallest bone here, the stapes. This would be ligament, ligament, ligament. Here's the tensor tympani muscle. Here's the, ten, here's the stapedius muscle. Okay? Stapedius muscle attached to the neck of the stapes. Tensor tympani attached to the malleus. The larger but the weaker of the two. And again here showing you the tensor tympani muscle, the stapedius muscle, ligaments, just one ligament here, we're just showing you. This is just like a schematic. Oval window, promontory, round window, the eustachian tube, blank space, snow. And here's another picture, eardrum, Malleus inca stapes, ligament, 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 tensor tympani muscle, and they're just showing a little piece of the stapedius muscle here. Now let's talk about middle ear physiology for a second. Let's share 
um, we're going to call it um, our notes. Where are we? Here we go. Don't worry so much about carotid artery, cord of tympani. It's a, those are all just things of interest for you, but the inner ear wall or the inner wall of the, of the closed middle ear space contains the oval window, the round window, and the promontory. Your station tube being closed unless being forced open. Put a star by this. Air pressure's got to be even, Stephen, on both sides of the tympanic membrane for the middle ear to work optimally. The middle ear mucus lining constantly absorbs oxygen. So the eustachian tube must open periodically to let new air in. Otherwise, you're going to get a vacuum. That is why tonsils that are swollen in a sore throat, they don't let the eustachian tube open up properly. And when that happens, you've got negative air pressure building up in behind the drum, sucking the eardrum back early otitis media. Then the next stage, because of the vacuum, the middle ear space rebels. And now you've got serous fluid building up behind the drum. And that serous fluid is non-infectious, like the fluid under a blister. It's clear. That's stage two of otitis media. Stage three, that serous, uninfectious fluid becomes white. Now it's infected with bacteria, and it's called pus. Eardrum is now bulging big time. First it was retracted inward due to the vacuum. Now it's bulging out. Okay? So look at the stages of otitis media. These are the middle ear ossicles, obviously. Please remember that when you're looking at the malleus here, the manubrium, the handle is embedded into the eardrum, and it doesn't cover the whole back of the drum. So look here. See how the malleus bone is just touching the top half. The end of it ends at the umbo. The bottom part of the drum has nothing attached to it. If you're looking here, again, the manubrium is this part. The hammer part is here. Okay, The manubrium of the malleus, the handle, of the malleus is attached to the top half of the eardrum. And then the short process of the incus, long process of the incus. Neck of the stapes, crura of the stapes, foot plate of the stapes. And now we get into middle ear physiology. Middle ear physiology. What does it do? This is also very important to review in middle ear in this unit. The middle ear increases sound pressure. It increases the pressure of sound. Why is this so necessary? It's so necessary because, look, this is filled with fluid. The cochlea is filled with fluid. And what is this, what's this filled with? Air. What's this filled with? Air. Airborne sound can't activate a fluid-filled cochlea. Airborne sound can't get into the water. And remember what we said, if your head is under a pool and I'm standing at the edge of the pool, I can yell till my lungs burst. You're not going to hear me because my voice is going to bounce right off the water. There is an impedance mismatch. Okay, the opposition due to sound, it, due to, to sound in the air suddenly meets a whole lot more opposition when, the, when my voice hits the top of the water. Because and that, that is called an impedance mismatch. Okay, so sound traveling through the air has hit a wall. So how can sound traveling through air, how can airborne sound activate a fluid-filled Cochlea, the only way it can is due to the middle ear. That's why you have a middle ear. You have a middle ear for two reasons. Number one, to transduce or change sound waves, compressions and rarefactions that are hitting your eardrum. It changes that into mechanical energy, piston-like energy. So now the foot plate of the stapes is pushing in and out of the oval window. 
Okay, so that's transduction, change of energy from one form to another form. Transduce, big word in our field. Second reason you got a middle ear is to increase the sound pressure, to overcome the impedance mismatch so that airborne sound can, C-A-N, can activate a fluid-filled cochlea. And it does so in three ways. And these are the three ways you should commit to memory. Here goes. Physiology of the middle ear. The middle ear increases SPL of airborne sound so it can activate a fluid-filled cochlea. How? Three ways. First, size of the drum relative to the foot plate of the stapes. Secondly, the leverage action of your two middle ear ossicles, the malleus and the incus. The malleus is a little bit longer than the incus. And three, the fact that your eardrum buckles instead of moving all as one unit. Those three things, now look at the values of each. Number one, 17 to one. The area here compared to here, 17 to one. Number two, the leverage action, the malleus is 1.3 times longer than the incus. So that's a 1.3 to 1. And the buckling action increases the pressure by a factor of 2 to 1. So when you put these things here, okay, here's the drum, ear drum, foot plate of the stapes in the oval window. Pressure is force over an area. This is 17 times larger than this. Then there's that leverage thing. Think of an axis running through here. And think of an axis, once again, running through there, just like a teeter-totter, like a lever. It's not even on both sides. The manubrium of the malleus is a little bit longer than the stapes. That's why on a teeter-totter or a seesaw, you give the kid the longer end. And you are heavier, so you get the shorter end. That's why a lever can lift a heavy object. So the same thing with the malleus and the incus. Malleus being a little bit longer gives a leverage action, which increases the pressure by 1.3 to 1. And then you've got the buckling action, which increases the pressure by a factor of 2 to 1. So you put all these things together by multiplying them together, and you get a pressure increase of 44 to 1. Remember the numbers. Memorize the numbers. So when you put all these things together, look at 110 acoustics. What happens when we increased the pressure by a factor of 10? If we called this 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared, and we called this 0 0.002 dynes per centimeter squared, that's 10 times more than this, right? Remember it was 10 times 10 times 10? Well, a 10 times pressure increase, you've gone up by 20 decibels. A 100-fold increase, you've gone up by 40. A one million fold increase, you've gone up by 120. Well, if the middle ear increases the pressure of sound by a factor of 44 to 1, if we happen to work out the math, 44 is somewhere between a pressure increase of 10 to 1 and a pressure increase of 100 to 1. And if you did the math, it would work out to about a 30 to 35 decibel increase. So the middle ear increases the pressure of sound by a factor of 44 to 1, which corresponds to a 30 to 35 decibel increase. You have the resonance of the middle ear ossicles, which hovers around 2,000 hertz. So basically, when you look at the resonance of the middle ear ossicles, plus the resonances of your outer ear canal, you get hearing sensitivity that's most sensitive between 1 and 4,000 hertz. See, that's what we covered this morning. The DBSPL required to just barely hear all the different frequencies, fewest decibels are required to hear between 1 and 4,000 hertz, precisely because of the resonances of your outer ear and the resonances of your middle ear. Not only the ossicles, but also the middle ear space. Here I drew it in color. Okay? Don't worry about these, these guys here. We'll leave them, just realize that they are curved. We'll talk more about the white and the yellow curves after your midterm in acoustics in a couple of weeks from now. Here's a question, though, that you need to be able to answer. If the middle ear makes up 30 to 35 dB, then why can a conductive hearing loss be more than this? 
What do I mean by a conductive hearing loss? Be sure you know what a conductive hearing loss is. A conductive hearing loss is a result of a blockage of sound transmission. Earwax, otitis media, anything that's blocking, that's mechanically, physically blocking the passage of sound to the inner ear. Conductive hearing loss, just like a wire conducts electricity. Conductive just means, excuse me, I got eighty nose. A conduction just means the, the passage. Okay, a conductor drives a train. Conduction. Okay, so conduction just means traveling through. Conductive hearing loss is a hearing loss due to a blockage of sound traveling through. So, so think of a conductive hearing loss as a plug in your ear. It's a plug in your ear. And those can be usually fixed. So if you have whopping degree of otitis media, guess what? You're going to have more than a 30 to 35 dB hearing loss. You know why? Because you're preventing the oval window and the round window from moving. Because you've got so much pus in that middle ear space that the stapes can't push in because the old the round window is blocked from bulging out. When you push in the oval window, the round window, okay, push this in. I should do it with this cheek. Okay, so when you're pushing the stapes in the round window would want to bulge. But if you're preventing that round window from bulging, because your whole middle ear space is filled with pus, then your hearing loss will be greater than the 30 to 35 dB that the middle ear makes up. And here's where a second tuning fork test comes into play. It's called the Rene tuning fork test. R-I-N-N-E. Rene. And it's done like this. Do you hear that sound? The guy says, yep. How about now? Whoa, that's louder. Do you hear it through the bone? Yep. Do you hear it through the air? Yep, but it's louder. Good, that's normal. That means your middle ear is working. If this and this sound equal, you got a middle ear pathology. Why? The Rene test is an eloquent demonstration of the 30 to 35 dB that the middle ear is making up. Okay, it's a demonstration of the 30 to 35 dB that the middle ear is making up. That's adding. Okay, because when I'm holding it here, I'm using my middle ear. My middle ear is involved. Sounds hitting the eardrum, which is wiggling the ossicles. My middle ear is involved. And it's that 17 to 1 pressure increase in the 1.3 leverage action and the buckling action is all in play when I'm doing this. But that's not in play when I'm doing this because with bone conduction, I'm bypassing the middle ear. So when I'm using the middle ear, it should sound louder. And that's why the Rene tuning fork test is an eloquent demonstration of the function of the middle ear. So now we need to finish with the acoustic reflexes. <clears throat> Those are the tightening of the middle ear ossicles by way of those muscles. So when you're looking at acoustic reflexes, here we go. Middle ear muscles, stapedius muscle, tensor tympani muscle. Here's all that physiology that we covered. The Rene tuning fork test. There's the three ways. There's all those numbers, the three ways that the middle ear does it. Maximum conductive hearing loss can be more than the middle ear adds up. This is what I just discussed earlier about that interplay between the oval and the round windows. That's covered on the top of page three in your middle ear notes. So make sure you have that. Resonances of your middle ear ossicles being 2000 hertz and a couple other resonant frequencies of the middle ear cavity. The acoustic reflexes. <clears throat> So now we finish with this, acoustic reflexes. Well, this, this slide here also describes why a middle ear pathology can, be, can be cause a greater conductive hearing loss than the 30 to 35 dB. So you have it in your notes, and you also have it in your PowerPoint slides. Described here. 
that interplay between the oval and round windows. Stapedius muscle, tensor tympani muscle, the acoustic reflex arc gets kind of weird in this picture. Okay, too many names in here. Don't worry about this. Outer ear, middle ear, they draw the malleus and the incus really strains. There's the foot plate of your stapes. This is a weird looking cochlea, if you ask me. Eighth nerve going to the brain stem. Just call this the BS <laughs> brain stem. And so that's afferent information brain going, and then you have fifth cranial nerve, I should say seventh cranial nerve, innervating the stapedius muscle, and the fifth cranial nerve innervating the tensor tympani muscle. But even though a loud sound comes in one ear, it's going to cause an acoustic reflex in both ears. Why? Because in the brain stem you have crossover. So I draw it like this, loud sound, Outer ear, middle ear, cochlea, eighth nerve, brain stem. And then outgoing fifth cranial nerve to tensor tympani, outgoing seventh cranial nerve to stapedius. But a loud sound in one ear will cause an acoustic reflex in both ears because of what they call decussation. D-E-C-U-S-S-A-T-I-O-N, crossover. Here's why otitis media is often more in kids than in adults. More horizontal eustachian tubes, so infection can more easily crawl up there. That's why teenagers tend to grow out of otitis media. Child skull compared to adult skull. Child skull is shorter. Following pictures here. All right, and looking at tympanic membranes again, just like we did. Otitis media will show an audiogram looking like this. The right ear being the O's and the X's being the left ear. Like a plug in the ear. Hearing gets a little better at 2000 hertz because of the resonances of the, of the uh, middle ear ossicles. But by bone conduction, the child's hearing is normal. Make sure we'll just stop here for a second. And I should share the notes because we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's look more at our notes here. Okay, so acoustic reflexes, the acoustic reflex arc, put a star by that, includes afferent brain going and efferent back to ear, afferent middle ear to cochlea to eighth nerve to low brain stem, crossover, decussation, efferent, fifth cranial nerve to tensor tympani, eighth cranial nerve to stapedius muscle. Acoustic reflexes occur in both ears only, even though only one ear is stimulated. Why? Because of crossover, decussation. And then they are strongest for low frequency sounds. Loud low frequency sounds cause the acoustic reflex. And what does the acoustic reflex do? It tightens the middle ear ossicles. So makes the middle ear, which is fairly stiff as it is, because the eardrum is tight, and the middle ear ossicles are fairly tight. They're all stuck together, okay? When you've got the pu pulling of those two muscles, you are tightening an already fairly stiff middle ear. You are attenuating sounds. You're making incoming sounds softer. The acoustic reflexes are there to temporarily make your ear work poorer. Okay, some used to think that the acoustic reflexes were a natural protection device against loud sounds because loud sounds, 80 dB or more, caused them to kick in. All right, but we now know and think about our discussion about the occlusion effect. How do we hear ourselves? Through air. And what's average conversational speech that we learned about in acoustics? About 65 dB SPL. So if I'm standing a yard away from you and we're just talking about the power of tradition in Spain and we're just yakking away, we're hearing ourselves at about, we're hearing each other at about 65 dB SPL. But how loud do we hear ourselves? We hear ourselves louder because we hear ourselves through air conduction and bone conduction at the same time, remember? We hear others through air conduction only. So when we hear a recording of our voice, 
we are hearing ourselves only by air conduction because the sound's traveling from the speaker of the, of the system playing to your ears. So when you're listening to a recording, you are hearing yourself as others hear you. And you're the only one who hates the recording. Everybody else says, oh, it sounds just like you. Okay? That's because you hear yourself not only by air conduction, but also through bone. And if average con speech intensity through air conduction is 65 dB SPL, you hear yourself at around 80 to 85 dB SPL. And that's why you have the acoustic reflex. The acoustic reflex dulls the loudness of your own voice while you are talking. Isn't that weird? So, and what is the loudest parts of your voice? Low frequencies, vowels. And that's why loud, low frequency sounds cause the biggest acoustic reflex. Loud, high frequencies don't cause much of an acoustic reflex. The loudest parts of speech are the vowels. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Thousands of words share those five vowels. What makes the words different are the high frequency consonants. Thin, fin, kin, sin, tin. They all may have in, but it's the k. So it's the soft consonants that tell us what the words were. The loudest parts of speech are the lowest frequency parts of speech. And those are the ones that we hear at about 85 dB SPL if left unattended, okay? Because we hear ourselves through air and by bone. Yeah, there's a, now we're done. But we've covered the outer and the middle ear as a bit of a review. Kind of a real mix of, just a, a menagerie of stuff, but here's hoping it ties together some of the pieces in the puzzle thereof. I'll stop recording here and wish you good luck on your midterm exams. All right, I'll stop recording now.